Good morning. It sure is a blessing to be with you in the house of the Lord today. And we want to welcome you to beautiful downtown Kiowa. We're so glad you're with us at Majestic View Church on this beautiful day that the Lord has made. It's kind of hard to think tropical thoughts on a morning like this, but we can still do it if we want to. Amen. 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 Well, well, just want to uh, roll, roll through, through some, some of our announcements. announcements. Uh, uh, my, my favorite, favorite announcement every year is the mark your calendars for our Thanksgiving dinner. That's our Taste and See event. Uh, my favorite event, one, one of them. And uh, so that's coming up on the 22nd. And so uh, you want to be ready for that. Uh, Corey Ten Boom, if you go to the website tenboom.org, has an amazing quote, and just because we are such a mighty church of prayer, her quote is, uh, is prayer our st steering wheel or spare tire? Amen. That was a little convicting. I wanted to share that with you. Uh, we have a lot of events going on. The uh, children's choir is right after the service, right after the service. So, uh, and then on November 1st, it's not in your bulletin, but we're going to have a prayer walk uh, around town. So you'll probably want to dress warmly. That's going to be at 8.30 in the morning on November 1st. And uh, I believe Russ has a photo to uh, share with us uh, today. So uh, this is the uh, first round of the Elbert County Kickball Championship playoffs. And... Uh, we lost. Yeah, we went in rank number one. The good news is Jessica and Jaren's team won. Uh, Jessica caught the best kick of my life and just kicked, yeah. And then, and it's hard. Angela and I are playing. You know, you have to not only kick the ball, then you got to run, right? So there's, there are a lot of demands out there. But uh, we sure had a super blessed time, and uh, the Lord is very well represented. And just thought you'd get a kick out of that. Thank you, Russ. Uh, we also, I, where's Leo? Leo, we had a great men's meeting yesterday. I want to thank all the guys that came. Uh, Leo turned us on yesterday to a search engine. It's called Duck, Duck, Go. And that's an alternative to uh, Bing or Google or some of these uh, search engines that are censoring a lot of Christian and other information. So if you want to go to something like that, uh, Leo, raise your hand. Uh, there it is. Duck, duck, go. Uh, he's your guy. All right. I think we are ready for Pastor Paul. Uh, is there anything you can think of? Oh, yeah. Uh, Elder Jim is coming up to talk about voting, and then Pastor Paul and Pastor John are coming up. Yeah. Welcome again. Oh, yeah. We got our sign up. Oh, yeah. Okay, so I promised, don't get mad at me. Hey, boss, don't get mad at me. I promised uh, Moose. Go ahead, Moose. Okay, before you leave, does anybody have a jacket they could loan to Pastor Brian? His <laughs> arms are awful cold, and it's even affecting his brain because he forgets some of the announcement. So if you have a jacket, talk to him after the service, okay? Hey, hey I'm jealous of your vest. It would fit over my arm. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you. Uh, 
Well, this morning, uh, I will be in the kitchen after the, the service. If any of you have moved recently or have not yet registered to vote, uh, this morning's the time to do it. I have the forms for you to fill out. Uh, this election is probably the most important election I've ever voted in in my life. And particularly for Christians, we ought to really show up and vote. So see me if you're not registered yet. Good morning. We're glad to see you. If you're visiting with us today, we want to give you a real special welcome and uh, glad you're here. Today we have a big treat in that uh, we're going to get to hear for the very first time uh, uh, from our new assistant pastor. For those of you that don't know the story, I want to very quickly tell you how this all came about. Back uh, last, about this time last year, maybe in November, uh, Pastor Paul responded to uh, our job posting on some job site, and I don't think he even remembers, and I don't either, where that came from. But anyway, the Lord drew his heart to us, and we talked a couple of times, and then he promptly forgot about us. And, uh, and so uh, the weeks went by, and in January, we began to communicate, and something happened. Uh, every time we talked, and that was about once a week, we began to pray together, and God began to stir our hearts and knit our hearts together. And then something crazy happened. I can't remember what it was in March that changed our lives, but anyway, um, that all came down. And uh, anyway, we, we hired him and brought him here in the midst of uh, one of the craziest times of our lives. And on June 1st, he became our assistant pastor. When we hired Paul, uh, there were two things we asked him to do, and that was one, to lead our worship ministry, and the other was to lead our discipleship ministry. And because of a lot of remodeling and a lot of stuff that's going on, uh, and it's been crazy. But anyway, today is an opportunity for you to hear his heart as he talks about where we need to go as a church, where God is leading us in our discipleship ministry, our small groups, and those sort of things. So it's my pr privilege to introduce him today. If you don't know him, you ought to uh, get to meet him. I got to watch him in action yesterday at the fall festival, and he was really a testimony of the goodness of the Lord and of our church yesterday as he was greeting people and meeting people, and I was tremendously encouraged by that. Not that I haven't been before, but yesterday was just a neat, neat day for us and uh, for Paul there. But today he's going to be speaking, and so we're... Uh, going to have uh, Matthew's going to lead our worship with the worship team but uh, I want you to be praying for him right now because uh, you can imagine how nervous he might be uh, as, as far as what this day looks like but this is not about Pastor Paul it's not about anything but lifting up the Lord Jesus Christ as every Sunday is so let's pray that God would use him mightily today as he opens the word and and he tells us what God's put on his heart before we do that, let's all stand. We're going to pray together, and then we're going to worship. The worship team wants to come on. We'll get going. Our Lord and our God, thank you for this day. And Lord, we know it more every day that we cannot exist. We cannot function properly if we don't talk to you and you speak to us so Lord right now we are asking you to come to this place today and speak to our hearts we pray that you'd use your messengers our worship team and Pastor Paul and Father we pray that the anointing of the Holy Spirit would fall that we could hear from heaven God, you know uh, what I need, you know what every individual needs, and you know what this church needs. And so we pray now, Lord, for your blessing to fall. And may we lay down the stuff, unpack the bag right now, lay it down, and worship the living God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
This first song is a, is a new song, probably for most of you. I hated starting the service with a brand new song, but it just sets up the tone of the rest of our worship time so well. It's just called The Awesome God You Are. And uh, it just talks about the hope we have in Christ and, and it talks about the awesome God that He is. Um, we're gonna, we'll start it out, we'll sing the first verse in the chorus, and then we'll go back and do the first verse again. So hopefully, um, at that point, you'll at least have the hang of it and can't blame
kids and, and teachers are leaving. I wanted to share something that happened on Wednesday night as we were rehearsing. Um, we had said a word, a little bit incorrect here, we had a word here that was wrong, and, and Russ had pointed out and said, hey, what's, what's supposed to be on the slide? And in this song, You Are God Alone, it, the chorus says, you are God alone, before time began. You were on your throne, you were God alone. I kind of stopped and I was like, wait, it's past tense. Like, why is it saying he was on his throne? He was God alone, right? Um, but then it goes on to say, and right now, like in the good times and bad, you are on your throne. You are God alone. And I've sang this song so many times and it just struck me on Wednesday night. How I never caught the past and the present tense in that. Like, just how it refers to God, he was on his throne. Even in these hard times, and in good or bad, whatever it is for you right now, he is on his throne right now. Amen. Psalms 47 uh, says, Clap your hands, all peoples. Shout to God with loud songs of joy. For the Lord, the Most High, is to be feared, a great king over all the earth. Amen. He subdued peoples under us and nations under our feet. He chose our heritage for us, the pride of Jacob, whom he loves. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our King. Sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth. Sing praises with a song. God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. The princes of the peoples gather as the people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong to God. He is highly exalted.
Well, good morning. I think I'm just going to pray and we'll close. <laughs> uh, I don't know how we can sing songs that are greater than what we just sang in exalting uh, that there is only one God, that he is holy and perfect, supreme over everything, that all of this, all of what we're seeing even in our country is it's just a drop in the bucket in comparison to the culmination that we're going to find when we see the glory of the Lord. And I pray this morning that you are welcoming that glory, that you have made your heart right with the Lord to say, come Lord Jesus, we want to see this glory, and that it wouldn't be of anything else, that you would see Him coming and say, oh no, it's too late. It's all true. I've heard this and I never heeded it. That wasn't going to be the beginning of the sermon, but <laughs> if that's all there is, that's the most important thing. Because our God is supreme above everything else. If you would, turn in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 4. As we begin this morning, uh, I'm, just, I'm just humbled that I have this privilege to be up here. Uh, I'm humbled that Pastor John's given me an opportunity to speak of this topic of a bridge to relationships with others. Uh, my heart beats about making connections, um, building relationships, not just within the church, but outside and within our community, with the school, with the town of Kiowa, with those who give of their lives and put themselves in the line of fire or danger, uh, with those who are broken and helpless and lost. And right now, this season is the hardest thing for them because they've already been trying to just scrape by the hopeless and helpless, the fatherless, and those that have seen brokenness in the home, that is what this good news is about. That is what this church is to be about, is love, love to all of this. We all, every area that I just mentioned, needs love to permeate into those areas. They need our joy, our humility, our love that has come from Jesus Christ through the Father, they need that in Kiowa, in Elbert, in Simla. I, I won't keep going because I'll mess up all the rest of the towns. I'm figuring them out. And this is where it begins. Love begins with God. Um, I think I like the tradition, let's all stand as we read God's word. Uh, I did not have that in the past, and uh, I think it is a very respectful and holy thing to do to stand for God's word. So let's read this, 1 John 4, uh, verses 7 through 21. All about God is love. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. Again, God is love. 
And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love. Perfect for our time and day. (laughs) But perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he, has, he, whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must love, must also love his brother. Let's pray together. Father, I pray your spirit does use me and speak through me and your word is what is heard this morning. It is powerful. It cuts us to the quick. It is all we have for life and godliness, for our direction and our purpose. Lord, may we go to your word for our plans and for our weeks and for our days. Lord, thank you that even on this Sunday, we begin this morning, maybe some of us with yawns, some of us still trying to wake up, Some of us that have been awake for four hours, we still begin in your word. Directed by what you would have us to hear, to heed, and to obey. Father, thank you for this word before us. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Love a bridge to relationship with others. Bridge to relationship with others. This bridge idea that we've kind of been discussing, it obviously, um, as we've probably heard, it involves building. But just a part of this building process that, that for those of us who've been here uh, week in and week out, we've continued to see how that has progressed. Uh, there was teardown. There was uh, plans <laughs> that came in and sketches were made and then erasing of those sketches and new sketches and new plans and then no, nope, that's not good, and we're going to do it a third time or a fourth time. And it just reminded me that every part, in the building process, every part depends upon the other. I, I, I mean, I could ask you for a raise of hands. How many of you have done a project in the last year, uh, or let's say last five years, and you're like, I'm glad that project is over. But you had to, <laughs> you had to think through every single piece of that project At least for me, I know I would probably get to a stage and then realize I'm stuck. Because I I realized I I had to do this and this and this and this to actually make this part work. Every part of the building process depends on the other. It was kind of, I mean, it wasn't humorous. I I know uh, these these men and women who are working every week are, are are sometimes actually getting frustrated because their plans get redone. But, you know, one, one department like the, the, well, for now, as you can see, the drywall, they've been waiting on everybody else. You know, they've been waiting on the insulation to go in. They've been waiting on the electricians to get their electricity right. They've been waiting on lights to come in and wood to come in for the framers to frame the structure. Every part of this process, even here at Majestic View Church, They've had to depend upon upon each other, and every part has been necessary. This is the process of building. If you want to read how Scripture talks about it, you can go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It talks about the necessity of every single one of us, that we all have been given a specific skill or spiritual gift or strength or maybe even weakness that we need to bring to the body of Christ because it is necessary. It is crucial. And this is just like the found, I'm just, today I'm just giving you foundations of, of why we must build bridges to relationships with others, why we must connect with others, why this is necessary is, is first off because we need each other. We, I need you. I actually needed a, a, a whole lot of you yesterday at the fall festival. Uh, there were just kids after kids after kids going through the line. 
I, I didn't even count, but it was just amazing to see how many families and young kids were going through these booths and, and, and us allowing to the Lord to make connections with these relationships. That's just part of the process. The truth is, we might think that, you know what, they, they, they really need us. Yeah, they, they need us. Uh, those, uh, the people in Kiowa, they, they need us. But, but r- actually, we learn also about our God from interacting with them. We, we need them. <laughs> My wife and I keep praying for a location to, to, to land. And uh, God is, from a, from a first prayer in May, or whenever that was, April, God opened the door on Shasta Court. Uh, thank you. <laughs> and there is just ripe opportunity around that whole cul-de-sac of relationships and people to pray for. And uh, my kids are biking around there and getting to know the kids. Uh, we got to see some of them yesterday at the fall festival. But God puts us in a location maybe where there are people around us. It, it, we might be like, uh, we might have like a five-mile driveway and that's not, not going to be the reality. But you might go to work where there's relationships. You might go to events or things where you're connecting with people. You're, you might go to the school. Uh, I got to see some young cheerleaders uh, giving it their all on Friday night for Kiowa football. And uh, just a lot of fun to see um, Kiowa in the community. That was kind of my first uh, local sports game. It won't be my last, so don't, don't laugh. Uh, it wasn't the best showing for Kiowa. Um, but I have great hopes for Kiowa Indians. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get my beanie and stay warm out there. It was freezing. I will tell you, it was freezing. But in, in this idea of building, um, we just want to begin this with the fact that t- typically when you talk about connecting with others and having relationships with others and getting together and, and have a coffee or have a lunch or, or a small group ministry, we we put up our barriers. We put up our reasons. Um, I have reasons of how that can be difficult. Um, this idea of, of calling our church body to be connected together and to come together. Um, it could be a barrier of time, and that's like the easiest one that we have, right? Uh, I just, I, I don't have a single moment in the day to sit down and rest. Is, is that you? <laughs> And, and typically we just say that as, as a way to, to put a barrier up. I, I just don't have the time for, you know, here it is. I don't have the time for one more thing. <laughs> and, and I believe um, as, we, as we progress into this ministry of connecting with each other and, and possibly having discipleship with one another and small groups with one another, I, I think this one is going to be the hardest because Everything around us is asking for our time, isn't it? And, and, and if you're going to be a part of it, you've you got to give your time. And, and we are immortal. Not we're not immortal. We're mortal. Uh, we, we sleep or we need sleep. Um, I need sleep. I know that this week. Uh, studying. I needed more sleep this week studying uh, that I did not give my body the sleep it needed. But we are people that need sleep. And we only have what, 12 to 16 hours in a day. And we thank the Lord for that. But, but we, we find ourselves saying, I don't have any more time. Well, with that comes the idea of purpose and planning and priorities. And, and if you look at your calendar, if I looked at your calendar, I would say, okay, I think I see your priorities. I think I see how you plan. I think I see your purposes. Our calendars, our time, show us what we make priority. And I believe we're going to have to ask ourselves this foundational question, is building relationships in love, is that going to be a priority at Majestic View Church? Uh, Some of us might think our talents, uh, you know what, I just don't have the skill to, I don't know how to just go up and say, hi, I, I understand that. Some of, the, some of the best conversations I've had, though, 
is with those who would say that. I, I don't go up to people. I don't, I don't just overflow and, and just pour myself out onto somebody else who's, who's like, whoa. Sometimes, though, I've had the best conversations with that individual because God has gifted them in a different way. They think through something that I have maybe given 10 seconds to, and they think and believe and are convicted of it deeply. We need one another. We are dependent on each other. Possibly, though, it could be treasures. I just don't have the resources. I don't have the ability or the funds or the house or the location or, or whatever. We might say, I just, it's just the resources. It's not possible. I know in our culture, things are hard in some ways. Uh, just in some cases, to connect at a fall pumpkin patch or something, uh, you're, you're looking at hundreds of dollars for a whole family. And you're going, I, I can't do that. I would say, look toward next year. The Kiowa Fall Festival was free. <laughs> so you no longer have any excuse if you want to connect with individuals out there. Um, and I am glad that that was a free event for my family and uh, so many others that could come out. But there are opportunities and ways in which we can make connection. Uh, I'm so excited about what's happening here for the future of Majestic View Church. Kids that can come in and play. Moms and dads that can come in and study or read or discuss or disciple one another over coffee, over a fancy coffee even if you'd like that. Um, drip coffee. There's going to be lots of different ways in which we are able to connect, not just with the church body, but inviting others to spend time with us from our community. Saying, hey, there aren't that many places to go sit down to have a cup of coffee, but I know of one place. Would you like to come join me? Excited for those opportunities. So we're building these bridges. With building comes these barriers. We saw that over and over again here at Majestic View. One hurdle after another, and our project manager has been so good in just trying to figure out how do we get over this hurdle? How do we get through this? How do we, how do we figure out a new direction, a new pathway? That's, that's, that's a great little segue into, into the Christian life. The truth is we're going to hit a barrier we're not going to have the same personalities. We might uh, need to ask for forgiveness of someone. How are we going to work through that? How are we going to get through that barrier? How is God going to say you need to work through to get to the other side of that? Out of love. And I, I, I start with this general idea of love. And it's a, it's a big word. It's a word that everyone uses in this world. But I want us to see it from the perspective of God's word and God alone. Love starts with God. I want us to see this kind of like um, progression. It's from God, it comes to us, and it goes out to others. That has to be the pathway of love. It has to come first from God into our hearts. We have to meditate and dwell and read in God's word as we did in 1 John chapter 4. God is love. And how did he love us? He sent his only son to die on the cross on our behalf. This kind of love, a sacrificial love, a love that looks out to the interests of someone else instead of my own. I'm speaking to myself here. <laughs> The love that God has given me is that I look out to someone else and I put them in preference. I give them honor. I ask them, how is your day going? I tell them, thank you for how you're serving or thank you for stepping in there. I think of someone else when I know the normal proclivity is to think of me and how I might want love. This is what God teaches us. Love starts with God. It has to. How does the Bible describe this? Well, I won't ask you to turn everywhere, but I do have a lot of Scripture truths that I want to share with you. Um, it begins with Exodus 34, verse 6 and 7. Exodus 
34, 6 and 7 says this. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. It's asked of Moses, show me who you are, God. And God says, what's the first description? I am a God, merciful and gracious. Slow to anger, praise God. Abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Some of your translations also might say compassionate. It's that idea that that God's heart moves. It aches to see sin. He cannot even be in the presence of sin. But he is this heart of compassion like Jesus shows us when he came to earth. As he looked on the crowds and he wept over them and he had compassion for them. and And he went to them. He even touched some who he was not supposed to touch. And he reached out and he loved them. I love those stories of of Jesus talking with the leper or the one who has been blind since birth or the one who is an outcast. And Jesus goes and he shows them his heart of compassion. God has never changed from that. And he tells Moses here, I am this. This is my nature and my character. I am gracious, merciful, full of steadfast love. My love will never fail, never change, never run dry. These same words are used all over Scripture. Numbers 14, 17, Nehemiah 9, 17, Psalm 86, 15, Psalm 103, verses 1 through 8, Joel 2, 13, Jonah 4, 2, Micah 7, 18 through 19. God is love. And when we ask ourselves, how do we define love? We have to ask ourselves first, how does God define it? God is the one who defines all things. He is the only God. He is supreme. He is number one. So we have to say, how does God talk about love And there's plenty of scriptures to show us that he is glorious and supreme. Just a few instances is in Genesis 17, Abraham is 99 years old. Actually, his name was Abram at this time in Genesis 17. And it says, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless that I may make a covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. And then what happened when the Lord visited Abram? It says Abraham fell on his face. The same actually happened with Joshua. When the commander of the Lord's army visited Joshua, the commander told Joshua, take off your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua also in this scene, falls on his face and takes off his shoes. <laughs> like the story of Moses and the burning bush. God is trying to convey to us, I am the only God, the most holy, the one to be revered and respected. There is no one like me. Just as we sang of these songs, these beautiful songs this morning, Our God is supreme. We find this even in the New Testament. When Peter is in the boat with Jesus and he catches this large amount of fish, he then realizes who he has in the boat. (laughs) And it says that Peter fell before Jesus, prostrate and humble. You know, many scenes where many in the New Testament fell before Jesus. 
Even the man who was possessed by demons in the caves in the sea on the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee in Luke chapter 8, it says that when he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down, and he cried out with a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? This lunatic, this man in the caves, had better theology than many around him. (laughs) And of course, sadly, it was those demons that were speaking the truth about who Jesus was. He is the Son of the Most High God. And I love the story, you know it well, I would hope, but Acts chapter 9, where Peter is on the way to persecute the church, to put Christians in jail, to try to snuff out this good news of Jesus Christ, this good gospel, this light that is coming into the world. And what happens? He meets the light. He meets Jesus, the light of the world. And he is knocked off his horse, if he was on a horse, I believe, Acts chapter 9. And he is put to the ground. And he is even blinded in the story in Acts chapter 9 by the glory and the majesty of Jesus, the Son of God, of God come in the flesh. That's where we find that God in his character shows us what love is. He shows us through his glory and his supremacy that he knows the definition of what love should be. And he demonstrated his love, as Romans chapter 5 says, He demonstrated it by sending his son Jesus and saying, I'm going to show you love in the flesh. The person who is love. The son of God. I don't know if you've ever read 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the chapter on love, and thought this thought. This is describing the son of God. Verses 4 through 8. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast, Jesus. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. Remember Jesus' words, Lord, thy will be done. Not my will, but yours, O Lord, is what came out of our Savior's mouth. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing but rejoices with the truth. Love, oh, I love this. This is not just telling us who the Son of God was, but it is telling us the nature of God's love for us. This is the kind of love we are called to have, we are actually commanded to have in 1 John chapter 4. Love bears all things. I could stop there and say, let's just pray for the rest of the service, that we would be people that would be willing to, Be willing to bear all things in our lives, in our family, and even in the lives of others. When they come to us with something that we would show them a love from God that can bear their weight. That can be with them in the hardest of times. This is that kind of love. This love bears all things. It believes all things. It believes the best. It believes the truth. And it hopes all things. Especially now, this year, 2020. (laughs) If, If it could be called the year of discouragement and despair, it also should be the year of love and hope. I pray for you, if you know Jesus Christ, that this is not a year of uncertainty, of fear, but of love and of hope. And of trust in our God. This is love. It endures all things. Love never ends. Or your translation might say, love never fails. The Son of God says, I have come in the flesh. I am God in the flesh. I am showing you what love is like. And I am the one who is the image of God himself. I love Hebrews 1.3. It says, he Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Jesus and who he is 
it's this word called he's self-authenticating. He doesn't have to prove who he is. He doesn't have to prove what comes out of him and who his character shows him to be or what his miracles say about him. He, he, he is basically one who says, by what I do and what I say and who I am, I prove that I am the Son of God. You know, there's actually illustrations in life that are like that. It, one of them is, is what we see a lot here in Colorado and what Sarah and I didn't see a lot of in Oregon, and that is the sun. It's self-authenticating. Uh, for one, don't ever look at it. If you look at the sun, it'll tell you what kind of a, 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 <laughs> a massive amount of glory the sun has because it'll blind you. But even if you go from, I think it's true here, at least in Oregon, it was definitely true. You go from the shade, and you see a sun line, and you go into the sun, ah, it's like 10 degrees different, maybe more. I, I mean, I, it's true here. Once the sun has gone down, like Wednesday night ministries, once that sun is down, I am freezing. <laughs> the sun is self-authenticating. It, 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 when it hits you, it says, I am here, <laughs> and I am warm, and you're not escaping my rays and my heat and my light. You know what else is self-authenticating? Honey. Well, at least, I've never had honey that has not been sweet. But I'm sure someone's going to come up and tell me, oh, let me tell you a story. <laughs> but you think of honey, you hear that word, and you think sweetness to the, to the taste. You know what else is self-authenticating? A bug. Because at least a fly or a mosquito, those two bugs, that's why they're called bugs. They just bug you. At least they bug me. I, 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 need, to ch I need to change my heart on that, but... Almost every time, I tell this to Sarah, almost every time a bug lands on my head is when I have both my hands in use and I cannot actually do anything about it. <laughs> That's the definition of a bug, right? He gets on you and you can't do anything about it. But they're self-authenticating. I, I think God put some humor in there by naming them those things. Jesus is glorious. He is Savior. He is risen. He is the firstborn from the dead, Colossians 1.18 says. So, so Jesus defines what life and resurrected life looks like. He is the first one to have risen, to have conquered, to have destroyed and defeated death. Amen? And, and the Word of God says if we are in Jesus Christ, we too will rise with him in life. We have nothing to fear in death. There is no more sting for death. Jesus brings us life. He brings us love. And he is the one who can turn the worst of news into the best of news. Now this is part of what we've been talking about as we've talked about prayer and repentance and being humbled before God. That is actually a gospel place, a, a place of good news where we should be when we are actually humbled and brought before God to where we have to say, I need you. Yes, I actually need you. I mean, praise God for every Sunday morning, I'm sure Pastor John and I would echo, we come before here and we say, Lord, we need you. We can't proclaim your majesty and your good news and your word unless you do it through us. We have nothing in and of ourselves. We need you. So love has to be defined and it has to start with God. For us to understand that if we're going to build relationships, we, we have to have a love, but we cannot just conjure this love within ourselves we have to realize the love that has been given to me, to us, so that that love is going to overflow to others. And yes, you know, this, this talk, this language is like the ideal, every day is a rainbow and blue skies kind of way. 
I know there are days where we're just asking, Lord, I need your love, and that's, that's what I need today. I just need to know that you love me still. I, 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 I'm not sure about the overflowing to someone else, but I'm in a place where I just need to know that you're, you've given me everything. You've loved me like no one else can love me. But as God shows us his love, and as it comes to us, it says in Romans 5.5 5, that love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. That is God's channel, his avenue. The love of God comes to us through his Holy Spirit. And then the next chapter, Romans 6, it says, how can those who have died to sin still live in it? It's this love of God that replaces this desire for sin. It's this majesty and holiness of God. It's who he is, his character that comes into us and pushes out this love of sin. We can't, we try, but we can't have two loves at war. One is going to win over the other. Are you bringing in and reading about and meditating and praying over how much God has loved you? And in doing so, that is going to change who you are on the inside to see that sin is just distasteful. And it doesn't actually love me. It actually is the worst. It leaves me empty and alone, and it doesn't come through with its promises. This is why we need to know who we are. We talk about who God was, that he is love. Who am I? We are crucified with Christ. Sin has been put to death, and God has poured his love into us through the Holy Spirit. Galatians 2.20, one of Paul's testimonies. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave of himself for me. That's the, that's the beautiful picture of, of agape love, of sacrificial love. God actually gave of his own life for my life. It's always that question we ask. Would we put ourselves in the place of, would we run in front of whatever to save the other person? That's one of the hardest questions we ask of ourselves as humans. And yet God says, I did that for you. I put myself in your place. You were supposed to be on the cross. You were supposed to take the punishment for your sin. And I took it. God took that for us. That is the best demonstration of this kind of love. And so we've been crucified with Christ. This cross that we are bearing is still the cross that points to the cross of Christ. It's not a burdensome cross to bear. It is a glorious, joyful cross because we are not on that cross. Jesus Christ went to that cross for us. And he is not there. He is risen indeed. We are crucified with Christ. We are also called out into the light. This love has called us out into the light. I love this is one of my favorite passages in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, uh, just that whole area, but 2 Corinthians 4, 4 through 6 says, "In their case the God of this world, 2 Corinthians 4, 4 through 6. In this case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them what what is the blinding about? It's to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel, of the glory of Christ. If you know Jesus Christ, you have been brought out of darkness into the light. You have been rescued. Your eyes have been opened to see the light of the gospel, of the glory of Christ, who is the very image of God. He is God in the flesh. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God said, Paul in the book of 2 Corinthians goes back all the way to Genesis. Let light shine out of darkness. He is reminding us the power of God to create light out of darkness is that same power that is shown in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of Jesus Christ. 
maybe for myself or for you today, all that you need to hear is, I need to go home and revel in what God has allowed me to see, the light of the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 2 has the same language. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people. Once there was no love. You were lost. You didn't know where to go or where to turn or you didn't know the solution. You were looking for a solution. You were not a people. But now you are a people. Once you received no mercy, you were under the judgment, the condemnation of sin, the wrath of God. But now you have received mercy through Jesus Christ. Is that true for you this morning? That you can say, I was lost. I wasn't part of a people, but now I have an eternal family, forever family. I was under judgment and wrath. I was feeling the condemnation of guilt and sin, but now I have come under the grace and forgiveness and mercy of God through the good news. What beautiful news. We're called out into the light. Uh, just for some reason this week, I just thought of that, that great picture, if you remember, A Bug's Life. There's two mosquitoes. I don't know why I'm about mosquitoes today. And, and they're flying, and then one goes, oh, and he says, I can't help it. The light is so beautiful. And, and sadly, he has a bad ending. But So this is a terrible illustration. But... But I just was thinking of those, those, those insects that are fixed, you know, the moths, those wonderful moths that we have. And everything else is just fixed on the light. They can see it. It's something bright amidst their darkness all around. But there's, there's a spot of light. And they just head for it. Do you, do you see that to be true for you? That even right now in 2020, there's just, there's just a lot of darkness but we have a light. Have you been looking at that strong light, that powerful light, that light that keeps you going directed toward it? And if you haven't, get your eyes away from the darkness and fix it on that light. Open the light that God has given us in His Word. Wherever it might be, Fix yourself on this light, this truth, amidst a very changing culture where we're given lots of half-truths. We're called out of darkness into the light. We have been given so many gifts. I just don't have the time to go through all of this, but Ephesians 4, i got to read Ephesians 4 because that is one of the staple passages. Ephesians 4 talks about what we've been given. And I believe this is crucial for us moving forward as we think of this bridge, that love has given us a bridge to relationship with others. How do we build this relationship? Look at what Ephesians 4, beginning in verse 11 says. Ephesians 4, 11. The beginning of the chapter talks about how God has made us one as a family together. We have the same Lord, the same baptism, the same gospel. And then in verse 11, it says, and then he has given us gifts to be used for his church, the body of Christ. In verse 11, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, those who care and watch for the the flock, and teachers, those who love to, to explain and give out and see the light bulb go on in others. He's given us those gifts for what purpose? To equip the saints for the work of ministry. For building up the body of Christ. He has given the word of God to be proclaimed. To then equip all of us to say, I have been given something. I've been given something that can be used. 
God has given us gifts for the work of the ministry. And here's that word even, for the building up of the body of Christ. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure, the stature, the fullness of Christ. What purpose? So that, and this is so important for us in this day and age, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love. This is, this is what this passage is calling us to do with one another. We speak the truth in love. We're to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. Well, what do I, what do I talk about? Talk about Christ. Talk about what he has done. Rehash it with one another. Remind yourself of what you've been pulled out of and what you've been given in Jesus Christ. From whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. I believe God puts within us this desire to bear fruit as believers, this desire to have gifts given and for us to exercise those gifts. Just like in the ground, when we put a seed in, it is amazing how that seed within its very nature and how it is made has this ability and and just within itself, God has put this nature of growth We really hope so. We want to see something green come out of the soil in about one or two weeks when we put the seed in. But that is the same thing as God has put within us a new creation, a new nature, that we have a dissatisfaction of just staying the same. We're praying, Lord, grow us, change us, bring fruit. I'm praying that for the church body, for us as a whole. Lord, make Majestic View Church an impact and a fruitful place. May we see lots of fruit. And of course, 1 Corinthians 13 is just an outflowing of what those gifts do, that that it is another showing of love to others. Even the Apostle Paul said in the beginning of that chapter of 1 Corinthians 13, if I speak the best that I could and give out eloquent words and have the best sermon, but I have not love, it doesn't matter. If I serve and I go to the greatest extent and I sacrifice and I even maybe put myself at death's door for the sake of Jesus Christ, but I do all of that without love, it's like a clanging cymbal. Or if you got those whistles yesterday at the fall festival, it's like those really ear-piercing straw whistles or whatever they were. I keep telling Elizabeth and Benjamin, can we put those away? (laughs) Please. God has come to us also to be examples to others. And this is the the heartbeat of, of small group ministry, of discipleship ministry, of connection ministry is that we are examples one to another. I love Paul when he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. And in other places, there's talk of we are learning, we are gathering things that God has given us to teach others. We don't just keep it to ourselves, we give what God has given us to others. Titus 2, 1 through 8 says, Let older women likewise be reverent in behavior, not slanders or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good and so train the younger women. And it goes on. And right before that, it talks of older fathers. And I would only imagine that the inference is fathers train the young men. We are poured in from the love of God into ourselves, but it cannot stay here like a dam or a reservoir that keeps it all. We are poured in from God with his love to give out to others. 
And that might mean this last point is that we are ones who practice repentance. I love this new verse that God just laid on my heart in the last few weeks. Isaiah 30, 15. It says, For thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, Isaiah 30, 15, In returning, or the word there is repentance, in turning around, in repentance and rest you will be saved. Yes, that's the good news. In quietness and trust you will find your strength. We've been talking of this recently, that in repentance there is a healing that happens. There is a a humility that we come to God and say, Lord, I need this. Lord, I need to see who you are better. Lord, I need to know your love so that I can go out and overflow in loving others. That is an act of repentance when we come back to God, maybe out of our self-sufficient track that we're going on, and we turn, as Isaiah 30 says, we repent and say, it's all from you. I've been trying to do this in my own strength. I've been trying to love in my own strength. I've been trying to make connections in my own strength. I've been trying to make all this happen in my own strength. But Lord, only you can do it. Jesus, his message was one of repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And I love this phrase in Romans chapter 2, verse 4. It is God's kindness. It is actually his love that leads us to repentance. It was that first act of love when we, when we realized he's done that for me. He went to the cross for me. It is that first kindness of God that has caused us to repent and to be broken. But that repentance is not just a one-time thing. We need to go back to that and say, look at what he's done for us. Look at what he's done for us. Look at all he has given us. And it causes us, his kindness leads us to repent. Say, Lord, I come back to you. I've been trying to run this in my own strength. So it's from God. It's to us through the Holy Spirit. He pours his love out to us, and then it's to others. And I want us to just all maybe be able to wake up from me causing you to go to sleep. (laughs) But we're going to do an exercise here, okay? So everyone get... Get a few big breaths in. And then I want you to take one big breath in and then just breathe out, but but just stay breathing out. Breathe out again. Breathe out again. Breathe out again. How was that first breath back in? God never made us to walk around. We can't can't give to others like that. Where we're just, and this is for me first, (laughs) where we're just giving. And then we're breathing out again and giving. And we're, and we're giving over here. And, and oh, another giving. But, but there's no breathing in. That life-giving oxygen. That, that can be the case for, for us as believers. We're just giving and giving and giving some more and giving a fourth time. But we're not taking in the oxygen in between those giving out, to be fed by God, to be rejuvenated by God, to be refreshed by God, to to take in his life-giving water from his word. If we are not doing that and we continue to give and give and give, like I just showed you, we will fall (laughs) out of breath, red in the face, with no more to give. So that, that's a foundation for us is we need the body of Christ. We need this morning gathering for us to receive and to have things brought back into our hearts and into our souls and into our spirit to be filled by his word and his truth once again 
And we just don't need that every Sunday. We need that during the week. We need that through ministries that we serve in. We need to be receiving from the Lord. Where do we start? Prayer. That is where we get from God. We might pray through his word. We might just have that communication with him where we are gaining and he is giving to us so that we can give out without falling over. So who are the others that we speak of here? Who are the others we're speaking of? There might be those that follow, like Jesus who said, come and follow me and I will make you not fishers of fish, but fishers of men. You might have someone who, who just wants to come and see what our church is about, wants to come and see what the kids' ministry is about, wants to come and see what this new renovation is going to be about. They just want to come and see. Jesus was pretty much calling those disciples, drop your nets and come and see and follow me and see what I can do, see that I will change the world. Others might need saving. We give to others who need saving. We might call someone to lift up their voice to the Lord and call upon him for salvation. Romans 10, 14 through 15 says, How will they call on him whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they're sent? Your other person might be someone who just needs to hear the good news of Jesus Christ so that they might be saved. There might also be those who would accompany us. I love the language in Acts chapter 16. There's a story where Paul uh, visits Lystra and Derby and that surrounding area and he meets this Christian named Timothy. And, of course, he's now famous because there's books in the Bible with his name. But he was just a young follower of Christ in his town. He was standing out because of his belief in the Lord. And here comes this, what I might call mega apostle Paul, big name guy who comes into town. For some of you out here, some of us see you that way. If only I could sit underneath that individual. If only I would be taught by that person. And here comes Paul, and all he says to Timothy is, would you accompany me? Talk about a small job description. <laughs> he didn't say, well, what's that going to entail, and how long is that going to be, Paul? And where are you going to go? Oh, prison and shipwrecked? and No, just come and accompany me. Follow me. That is the heartbeat of discipleship. That is the heartbeat of connecting and relationship with others. Hey, I'm going to do this. Would you come with me as we do it together? Hey, I'm building this for this ministry. Do you have any skills that you want to build this with me? We might call others to just accompany us. Hey, I'm running into town to go grocery shopping. You want to run in and go with me? Or maybe you can watch my kids so I can. <laughs> but all of that is a way in which we build relationships with one another. We are able to spend time with one another. And then there is this idea in Scripture, this language of that others might listen, learn, and then teach others also. 2 Timothy 2.2 2 says, And what you have heard from me, so Paul is speaking to Timothy, in what you, Timothy, have heard from me, Paul, in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men, I'm guessing men in Timothy's church, but it doesn't just stop there, who will then be able to teach others also? Who will then be able to teach others also? Who will then be able to teach others also? God's heartbeat is a heart of generations from those who might say, I don't have anything else to give in, in, this, in this culture, in my generation. I'm just kind of getting to the end. You have so much to give to the next generation. And you who are in the next generation have so much to give to my generation. <laughs> and I have so much that I need to give to the ones who are below me. And they have much to give to the ones that are coming after them. 
This is the heartbeat of God. I love, I don't know if you've ever seen this, but, uh, and we're almost closing here. I, I, I am really going to be honest about that. <laughs> Psalm 78 talks of this love of God for the generations. Psalm 78. This is what it says. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old, things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, but tell them to the coming generation, the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children that the next generation might know them and the children yet unborn and arise and tell them to their children. Do you know how many generations is mentioned in there? Ten. I don't know. I don't know if it's ten. <laughs> it could be. At least six or seven generations. Look at the family of God here. Think of the generations we have. God's heart is for even those yet unborn to hear of his stories and his faithfulness and his love and his son, Jesus Christ, to save. So we might tell those who are just going to come and see, they're going to follow us. We might tell those who need to be saved, who say, how, how must I? What must I do to be saved like Nicodemus? Or we might call others to accompany us and learn what we are learning and what Jesus is teaching us, we're going to teach them. This is the process, the foundation of love and the foundation of discipleship and connection and small groups and everything. It comes out of a desire that we all are necessary parts within the body of Christ and we all are called to love one another. As we close, as we pick up the hammer in the building process, there was much of that being done here in this building. As we get to the work, there are things to believe. To believe. This, this, this flow of God to us, to others, begins with prayer. It only makes sense. We're speaking to God, maybe upon ourselves, for ourselves, but we're also speaking to God on the behalf of others. You know, you're saying, how do I start with loving someone else? Or how do I start with, with even the reaching out process? Start praying for them. Start putting a, a specific name on your heart and just say, I'm going to pray for that name. I'm going to pray for that individual. And then I'm just going to see what God does. I'm going to see that he might open a door. He might open a conversation. He might open a way in which I could serve that person. Just start praying and see what God does. He made us for grace-filled relationships. You look at himself and his nature, the Trinity. God is not alone. He has the Son. He has the Spirit, the Father. They are all one together in perfect community with each other. We were made to be in relationship. Even God said before there was sin, it is not good for us to be alone. We are created for one another. And I didn't get time to go into all the one another's of Scripture, but God created us to exercise the one another's, serve one another, give honor to one another, pray for one another, and we could go on and on. Maybe for you today, though, it starts with some purposeful repentance. Father, I, I just, I just been flying so fast that I have not even prayed for that person that I've been thinking about a lot. I, I just... I just keep saying I don't, I don't know how, what I could give, Lord. I don't have the skills needed. I, don't have, I just keep putting up some kind of barrier to making a connection, to building relationships. It might start today with repentance. And the beautiful thing is that's what this church is here for. Healing comes through his word. It comes through prayer. It comes through his church. I know you could say this. We could go testimony after testimony of how God has used individuals here in this room to bring healing and to bring love from someone else to someone else and to bring restoration and a new story for somebody. 
So what is or what's going to be your bridge? You know, we shouldn't all have the same bridge. That's the danger to say, let's just do it this way. God has given us all very different ways to do it. But what it, what's the question you're going to ask yourself? What will be my bridge? How has God gifted me? What will be the way I will connect and make relationship with others? And then what is your biggest barrier? I'm going to ask myself this. What, what is Paul Parker's biggest barrier to connecting and making bridges to relationship? What is the biggest, I'll say the word, excuse <laughs> or reason I give? What do I give over and over again to say I just can't do it? Bring that to the Lord. What does repentance and trust in him look like? And then here's just some ideas, some ways I believe that we're going to flesh this out as we move forward uh, in terms of classes for teaching, in terms of maybe small groups for investing in one another. There are things that we can be doing right now, right now. We could be praying intentionally together. Some of you are doing that constantly, week in and week out. You are praying together. There is something about coming together with others and just praying together. We saw that over the weekend of repentance and prayer, how powerful God worked. We're going to continue that, as Pastor John has mentioned. We want to keep that humble attitude of repentance and prayer. Maybe for you it's reading and applying the Bible together. Just say, hey, you know what? I've really wanted to go through the book of Esther, or I've really wanted to, to read a gospel like Luke. Or maybe, maybe let's just start with the shortest one. Let's start with Mark. <laughs> but, but would you do that with me? Would you read Mark with me? Let's do this together. Or maybe there's training and serving opportunities together. Every Saturday, well, sometimes almost every Saturday, there's ways in which we're unpacking these chairs. We're getting the service ready for Sunday. There's ways in which we can serve even with this remodeling. There's ways in which we served in the past with food and we're hoping to serve in the future. There's ways to serve Wednesday night, kids' ministries. There are so many ways to be trained and to serve together. What about shepherding and caring? You know, Pastor John and I and Pastor Brian and others, the leadership, we, don't, we may not be able to touch everyone. We may not be able to actually sit and pray with everyone. But there is an aspect where God has given us all gifts. Every one of us is an important part to the church where you could say, I'm going to at least go and pray with that person. Or I'm just going to tell them an encouraging word. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for showing up at the football game Friday night. Thank you for saying hi and, hey, would you like to come sit with me? Making me not feel like I'm kind of, new and alone and don't know anybody here. There's ways which we can care for others. And then there's ways which we as a church together get to go out into this community, into the world, and display God's grace together. We can be in Kiowa or in Elbert or in Bennett or in... I'm getting lost now. (laughs) Elizabeth! (laughs) Like, wait, what's the, what's the big town over there? In Elizabeth. There's ways which we can go and be God's light together. The story of Dare to Share just was an example of that. As a group of them went together. They didn't go alone. They did this together. And they went house to house together. And they went at least two by two together. And they were able to speak of how God was working in them and how God might have changed someone at the door, or given a great conversation or a way to pray for them. They did this together. And this is my hope and prayer that we continue to see more of these things happening. As we, out of God's love to us, God's love poured in our hearts, given out to others, as we come together, we make relationships, we build these relationships, and we might meet during the week, We might meet one-on-one with someone. We might say, let me take you out for a coffee or a lunch. And we do these things together. For that is the heart of God as well. That we grow ourselves up in his love till we be a unified body of Christ, as Ephesians chapter 4 says. Amen. Let's be the church together to be a strong, powerful testimony of what God can do. So, 
What's going to be your bridge to relationship? How will you repent of your barrier to those relationships? How will I do this first? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your nature, who you are, that you are the God who shows us perfect love. Lord, you are the one who poured into us love so that we might reach out to others. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the body of Christ, that we need each other, that you have made us into a body, every part being necessary and essential. Lord, you get all the glory and all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, if you are one of those who say, well, I I have relationships and I have uh, connections, but you've come today um, saying, you know what? I know people, I I participate in a lot of things, but but there's still something empty. There's still something missing. I've reached out, I've served in this community thing. I'm trying to connect with others. I, I think I'm actually doing what you just said. I'm trying to build relationships, but you haven't built the most important one. You're not receiving supernatural, heavenly love from God first, then then just stop everything else. Make that relationship the first thing. Say, Father, I've heard your name. I've heard of your love. I've heard of your son, Jesus, who's been on the cross. I just heard of it. It's just a story to me. But you know what, I've been, I've been looking to every relationship, maybe it's my spouse or, or my group of friends or my organization, and I've been looking to those things to, to fill me up, and they haven't. And they shouldn't, and they won't. They are not what will satisfy our souls, our hearts. Only when we find our love rooted in Jesus Christ and in God the Father, and in what he's done for us. Only when we find that will we be satisfied, will we be filled. If you feel like you need to come and talk with him, or talk with Pastor John or Pastor Brian or one, would you do so today? I love Paul's words. Today is the day of salvation. Today is to make that most important relationship right with him first. Do that with him first. Because no other relationship is going to work itself out unless you have him as your father as the most important relationship. Will you stand?
that are full to build bridges of love to other people. Help us to understand what that means personally. Thank you for your word and for this time. We love you much. In Jesus' name, amen. I got something real special before we leave today. Uh, we said thank you a few weeks ago when it was Dante's last day <coughs> to work in our sound ministry, but he came back for a couple of weeks, <laughs> and uh, now he's got his special bride with him, and y'all come up here a second, come here, I didn't, this is impromptu, okay, but it's important, you know, I have prayed over this guy, and I've prayed for him, and uh, I'm going to pray for you, they're going back to Virginia, I'll try not to be mad at JC for taking him back there, okay. Uh, but uh, I told Dante, I'm not giving up that they may come back here someday, okay? Amen. Uh, but anyway, I want to pray for you. This body wants to pray for you. And congratulate you right here in front of everybody on your marriage. We're excited. Yeah. You did well, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, one of the things we told him at the day we had all the men pray over him that, that came uh, was uh, no man... Uh, that marries well doesn't marry up. <laughs> Amen. All right. You did good. <laughs> Lord Jesus, thank you for Dante and, Dante and Jason. God, we thank you for the joy in their heart, in their eyes, and their life as they start this together. And Lord, as this church sends Dante out to be a difference maker in another part of the country and the world. We pray for your blessing upon him, his family, his home, his new relationships, his new friends. God, I pray you give him those things. And bless them. Bless them that their hearts will truly be made one every day more and more. And Lord, I pray that as they keep you in the center of their home, that they would know how your love binds us together. We love you much. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Got two things as we go uh, that we need help with today. Of course, the chairs go over here. You might have noticed they're a little less blue today, a little more white. That's uh, their sanding sheetrock, okay? Uh, sanding joints, so it's, it's really dusty. So we need all the chairs over here. And this one's a big one. Uh, we have a delivery of our flooring. Do you know what that means? It means we're getting close. I mean, the flooring is one of the last things, okay? But it's outside on the sidewalk. There's about 5,000 pounds out there. I don't want to pick that up by myself, but we can't get it inside with a forklift. So we need those 30 to 40 pound bundles brought in and stacked in the church. And if you don't help then Pastor Paul and I get to do that this week, okay? Uh, so if, if there's some folks that can pick up that much weight that would like to help us, many hands would make that go a whole lot faster, okay? And we will direct traffic as to where we want to put it, uh, but please help us out with that if you can. If you're visiting with us today, uh, we don't do this every Sunday. This is remodel time, okay? <laughs> but uh, I just so know that, but we also believe in group participation, so... Uh, we're calling for that today. That's right. Many hands make the work go. Life work. Life work. There you go. All right. Okay. Okay. And we do have, for those that want to see our annual budget that we'll be proposing next week officially, they're on the back table back here if you want to look at a copy of that. All right? All right. What are we going to sing as we leave, Matthew? <laughs> 
We're going to go back and revisit the awesome guy you are. By the way, that flooring is out here on the front corner of the building. <laughs> <laughs> you know where it is. <laughs>